they don't really like me Cause I go fuck your bitch and fuck your mom and I Industry plants are artists that are planted in the music industry by labels or other important people. Sometimes they can be hard to spot, and sometimes they are painfully obvious and generic, which can deter people from wanting to listen. And those are the people that we're going to be checking out today. So today I have gathered four artists that were planted in the music industry, but failed to grow. But first, let's quickly define what an industry plant is. So the term industry plant is thrown around all the time, with tons of people giving it different definitions. For example, when you Google industry plant, the definition is artists who have only just started in the industry and are then picked up by a major label and groomed to be a star. But the issue with this definition and many similar ones is that it can be applied to a lot of artists. The whole point of a label picking up an artist in the first place is to help them blow up. A better definition is an artist who is a major slash indie label backing their movement but presents themselves as a homegrown startup to create the illusion of an organic following. But the issue with this definition too is that whether or not you're an industry plant, a lot of artists aren't very talkative about their label and a lot of artists like to run with the did it on my own narrative. So that doesn't really help narrow down the list. However, for the sake of this video, I'm going to define industry plants as artists who sign early in their careers and have their image created mostly by the label as some sort of marketing gimmick. What I mean by this is that these artists have their personality, their music, and their style tailored to a certain audience, which typically comes off as very inauthentic. You'll see what I mean as we go throughout the rest of the video. So let's start off with one of the most notorious industry plants that there is, Jumex. So Jumex is one of the first artists that people- Jumex had one good song to, to me. Industry plants. He's an artist who started blowing up in 2019 but bro was trying way too hard to be x it's pretty apparent right off the he was trying way too hard to be x that he was an industry plant the song was a cookie cutter yell rap song where he's yelling the hook and then he raps a verse while forcing his voice to sound like this the chorus was that probably was his label forcing him to be like x trapped and i can't get out so might as well get high i'm trapped and i can't get out so might as well just die and i don't mind mediocre lyrics and stuff being repeated like lil pump is a good example but at least lil pump had some sort of character and some charisma that made the song fun jumex's song was just hey x is popular let me try to copy that exactly it was apparent that like literally exactly because of this song is because it was his first song and it had a music video directed by x odd future member taco who's pretty up there in the music industry wow. and he was already signed when this song was released so then it begs the question how did Jumex get planted? Well, Jumex was your average high school SoundCloud rapper who was fascinated by music from artists like Lil Peep, X, and others. He was releasing some music before he was planted, but it was even worse than his newer stuff. You were never there, hearts broken to despair. I saw you in Terrible. summer, just a girl with long hair. It just sounded like some Lil Peep inspired music with poor production. And that's how all his music was at the time. And on top of that, he was trying to look the part of a SoundCloud rapper as well. However, he went somewhat viral after posting a video online where he was smoking weed in his class and yelling World Star. This video caught the attention of Bradley Scoffern. Bradley Scoffern is a guy who's worked a lot with Odd Future. He used to help manage Tyler the Creator and worked with Golfway. He had been working with them as early on as 2012 and also worked as a carnival director at Camp Flognaw. So people theorized that Bradley found Jumex from this video heard his music, decided to invest in him, hooked him up with some industry connections, and, and therefore planted him in the music industry. People have also said that the label he was with, Corton Records, was created by Bradley, made to look like some indie label, even though there was tons of money behind it. Like I said, this isn't a confirmed fact, it's just speculation, but it would make a lot of sense as to how Jumex got all these industry connections. People also theorized that Bradley had Taco direct his first music video and song, and Taco even played it during his DJ set at Camp Flognaw in 2018. His following song, Loner, was released shortly after Trapped, and he had writing assistance from I Love McConan, who actually helped him on a bunch of other songs, which is kind of sad when the songwriting is so terrible. There's also screenshots of Jumex asking people to write him a song about flexing but emotionally. He got a genius interview for this song and people clowned on it, with top comments like, Jumex looks like a monster energy can personified. <laughs> Jumex also did this thing where he would just glamorize being sad because it was trendy, really trying to appeal to the emo type of community. So with a little bit of digging, it looks pretty obvious that he was planted in the music industry, and after releasing some EPs and singles throughout 2019 and 2021, collaborating with people like Lil Xan and Travis Barker, it seems like he parted ways with Corton Records. His numbers started slowing down and Corton probably realized that their investments had failed, so it's likely that they pulled out or maybe Jumex left them, I'm not sure. So as of now, he's been releasing his latest songs independently with little to no success. I honestly think that the reason he failed is because his first impression was so terrible. The music wasn't great right off the bat and the industry plant thing was so apparent. In my opinion, his music did get 
a lot better over time, but because people had these preconceived notions about him, yeah, don't really nobody want to hear that shit no more. Out. And that brings us to it don't even uh, matter if his music is good. Nobody don't want to hear that shit. Goth. So Baby Goth is an artist that just appeared one day. She popped onto the scene when she was featured on Trippy Red's album A Love Letter to You Three on November 9th of 20. I was wondering who the fuck Baby that, Goth was. I kept hearing about this bitch. Trippy Red and Little Zan. So right off the bat, she looked like an industry. Like she just came out of fucking nowhere. And she was already on Trippy Red's album. But there's a bit more to the story. Before she became Baby Goth, she was always really into music. She started making music under the name Bria Bueno and had been doing covers and releasing her own music. She was even with an indie label called Rewind Records. In 2016, she posted an Indiegogo campaign with the attempt to raise money so she could make an EP. Unfortunately, though, she only raised $320 out of her $14,000 goal. That's Eventually, she terrible. was able to release her EP called Babyface, which was more like a pop sounding project that was actually pretty decent. She had a pretty good voice, and I think she could have had more potential with that had she not rebranded. Baby Goth was doing a ton of things to try to get noticed, and she claims that she was eventually noticed by some people in the industry who found her on their Explore page on Instagram. She then signed to Republic Records, which is a branch of UMG, which is one of the big three record labels in the music industry. And when she got signed, she underwent a huge rebrand, covering off her previous career and creating a new image, which is a theme we see among many other industry plans. Her new image was face tattoos, flexing money, and posing with guns. Her and her label were also seemingly hiding the fact that she had a husband and two kids so what? her label was trying to make her what really guns. Her and her label were also seemingly hiding the fact that she had a husband and two kids, so clearly her wow. label was trying to make her appeal to a certain audience, which like I said earlier is a marketing gimmick. Baby Goth then began blowing up after her first few songs. However though, shortly after she started releasing music, she was exposed by a YouTuber named Progress who basically proved she was an industry plan. He even found a video of one of her managers saying himself that he made her entire image and brand. He said wow. that she was like a potato with no personality, so he gave her one. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Damn. You got to make them look cool, right? So we get a cool name, right? All we had to do, we get face tats, because all these artists got face tats, right? So you build a aesthetic, you build a brand, right? So when she walks into the office, she looks cool. You know what I mean? That's, that's all labels want. And that was insane to see. I cannot believe that he admitted that online for people to see. And honestly, her music as this Baby Goth crazy. wasn't even that bad. Like, I'm not going to go listen to it personally, but that brings me to another point that I want to make in this video. At the end of the day, in my opinion, if the music's good, that's all that matters. Anyway, she released an EP and continued releasing music throughout 2020, including a song with Slim Jimmy. But as she kept releasing, her numbers continued going down. The fact that she was an industry plant and her music seemed so inauthentic is most likely the reason why her career didn't work out. She's been teasing new music to this day, but has not released anything since 2020. Our next industry plant is some... Sorry guys, one second. Hey, what's up, man? Hey man, I'm watching your new video and I love your shirt. Ha how are you seeing the video? I'm filming it right now. It's not even out. Don't worry about it. Anyways, where'd you get that shirt? Well, I got this industry plant themed shirt that I'm a good way and I'd really appreciate it. Once again, it's maddieballs.com. Not too hard to remember. So yeah, make sure to check out the shirts if you're interested. Anyways, back to the video. Our next industry plant is someone with one of the most fascinating origins out of anyone else on this list, and his name is Smiles. So Smiles is a rapper whose name may sound familiar because he was featured I think I heard on Smiles before. album Tattletales on the song Charlie. He released his first song as Smiles a day before that 6 9 song came out and has been releasing music consistently ever since. He hasn't seen much success and has only had one song since then crack a million plays, and that was a song featuring Snoop Dogg called Happy. So how did an extremely small rapper get featured on 6 ix 9s album and get a feature from Snoop Dogg? He's gotta be an industry plant, right? Well, I can't say whether or not he's a traditional industry plant because he's had a career spanning over a decade before becoming Smiles. But I do consider him an industry plant of some sort, and you'll understand why after I explain it. So I think we should start with Smiles' dad. His dad is a man by the name of Bruno Mascalo, who is a multi-millionaire with an estimated net worth of $560. $75 million. Now, the reason I think this guy's his dad is for three reasons. One, he follows Smiles and a Smiles fan page on Instagram. Two, they both have the same name. Three, he mentioned in an interview he has a son in a rock band in LA. And you may be wondering, isn't Smiles a rapper? Why'd you say that he's in a rock band? Well, that article is from 2011, when Smiles was in a rock band by the name of Drive A. He was the lead vocalist and guitarist. And I'm not gonna lie, their music wow. was pretty solid. The band was formed in 2007 and put out music until so 2011. So they took him from their rock band shit 
turned him into actually a pretty SoundCloud rapper. Has a music video with over 160,000 views. And there's a ton of people in the comments saying that they actually missed the band or that they saw them live on tour with other bands. However, I can hardly find any information about this group. And after label really said, look, that fucking Smiles band shit ain't gonna band get no money. You need to become a SoundCloud the rapper. Franco. They started the band in 2011, and by 2014, the band had just finished a nationwide tour that they headlined and then released their debut EP, Gold Handcuffs. In 2015, after releasing their second EP, it seems like the band split, leaving just Jack Franco, who is now going by Jack Bruno. He was also struggling with drugs, which may have had a hand in that. Jack Bruno was active as Raw Fabrics until 2016, when he decided to go solo as Jack Bruno, but instead of making rock music, he made rap music. I believe he started releasing rap music in 2017, and that's when his Nigga career got grass, extra like, weird. He had songs right from featuring a fucking Famous window. Dex, who was super hot at the time, and he also had a song with Playboy Cardi. For some reason, some of his music was released as 92 Jack, so it seems like he's been having identity issues throughout his career. Regardless, he was somehow very involved in the industry and had tons of connections. He's open for artists like Wiz Khalifa, Juice World, Lil Pump, Lil Skies. Around this time, all these Frank niggas Trevor. was it's like, left a lot of people wondering that, that, that SoundCloud era was peak this. And I've seen some people speculating that he paid for them. And that would make sense since no one really knew who so he was. So everybody was trying to clone that shit. At some point. Everybody was trying to clone a little peep. On, but the music the juice was world kind of crazy, like this live Dunkin' Donuts performance he did. Trying to eat a diet, then you eat a donut. When you're trying to stay sane, then you up and go nuts. Anyways, he released a lot of music as Jack Bruno, although most of it's been deleted from streaming services. But then in 2020, Jack Bruno again rebranded to Smiles, whose persona was essentially that of a 2010 smiley face emoji. It seemed like he was trying to have a similar image to 6 9 He came out as Smiles under Create Music Group, which is the same group that has worked with 6 9 YNW Melly, and more. So people speculate that the reason he has all of these connections isn't because a label scooped him up and tried to make him an industry plant, but instead people speculate that he's just asking his dad for money so he can pay for these extremely expensive features and pay to open for people on tour. So that's why I'd say he isn't a traditional industry plant. It's more like he used his dad's money to actually plant himself in the music industry. Wow. And since he only has 18,000 monthly listeners, despite all of these features and connections, I'd say it's been a failed attempt. So yeah, Smile's career is crazy and I haven't seen anything like this. So maybe I'll do a full video about it one day in depth. And that brings us to our final industry plant, Icy Narco. I'm Icy Narco and I deserve to be a oh! self freshman because I taught Sponge how to now I think the insane success of the SoundCloud era had labels foaming at the mouth trying to capitalize on it because Icy Narco is a clear cut Lil Pump clone industry plant. And while making this video, I realized that my definition of industry plant may have been a little too strict. So I'm gonna bend my definition just a little bit for this section because Icy Narco did have a tiny bit of buzz before he got signed and he also had a very similar image, but it's still pretty apparent that he's an industry plant being marketed towards a certain audience and here's why. So Icy Narco began making music in 2016 back when he looked like a normal kid, but he didn't really get much attention. Throughout 2017, he changed his sound and style to be much more similar to that of a Lil Pump or some other trendy Florida rapper. His music was very mediocre, but the sound was trendy, so he did garner a small fan base. Songs like You, Viagra Niagara, and more helped him grow his audience. Because he was already appealing to the Lil Pump type of audience, the label he would eventually sign with didn't have to do much to alter his image. It was already there. They would do some other inauthentic, cringy stuff, but I'll get to that later. All they had to do was just scoop him up and push his mediocre music, which is exactly what happened. Icy Narco signed to 10,000 projects in late 2017 or early 2018 and instantly began blowing up. He even said himself that when he signed to 10K, he hardly had anything and had recently just moved out to LA. This is a label that's worked with artists like Ice Spice, 6 9 Ian Dior, Trippy Red, Coin, and many more. His first few songs that were released on streaming instantly blew up and he got millions of streams. Icy Narco got a No Jumper interview and was seen with many other artists like YNW Melly and Young Nudie. However, the gimmick wore off quickly and his streams immediately plummeted after his first few songs. And of course, some people were enjoying his music even before he signed, but it was very short-lived and a lot of his views were probably just from people who wanted to check out the new and blue Lil Pump. He dropped his album Winter Can Be Murder in 2019 with 10k and it performed very poorly. It seems like his label even had him link up with Gary Vee for some reason, maybe for publicity or PR, but it's clear that this was a corporate decision. Regardless, after 2019, he stopped working with 10k Records and has only released five songs since. The reason he didn't work out is because his style was so unoriginal and it was very obvious that the label was just trying to capitalize on this trend. Most viewers were aware of this too with top comments like, this guy jacked so many rappers in one track and XXX the smoke pump god. And again, I wouldn't <laughs> say his music was that bad. It was decent, but it lacked any originality and it was capitalizing on a dying Nigga, trend. Nigga, Dicky did so like five different fucking rappers. In the music industry, he failed to grow. 